Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to open this evening's proceedings. So, my name is Paul Davies. I'm director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science. That's what you see on the screen there. And the premier event in our annual calendar is the Beyond Annual Lecture, where we invite a world-renowned scientist to perhaps go a little bit beyond and give us a vision for the future in their particular field. And this year, uh, we are uh, co-sponsoring the event with, the, uh, with ACE, the Arizona Cancer Evolution Center, and that's we are conveniently behind me. Uh, and uh, that's a, a major National Cancer Institute uh, sponsored research program aimed at understanding the evolutionary dynamics of cells in tumors and also how cancer has shaped the evolution of life on Earth. And you'll find information about both of these organizations in the cards that are being distributed outside. Now, in the Beyond Center, our motto is confronting the big questions. Uh, for example, a little later this week, we have a workshop on the emergence of meaning. What does that mean? Well, uh, for example, DNA is packed full of coded, meaningful information, uh, the instructions for life. How did such a thing arise in a universe governed by the laws of physics? It's a profound puzzle, but it's a question that nicely brings us to tonight's speaker. Uh, if DNA is a type of meaningful text, then that text can be edited, which is the subject of the lecture you're about to hear. Uh, Jennifer Doudner is Professor of Chemistry and Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, and the order of that is apparently very important, uh, at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, her pioneering work on gene editing technology has opened a vast new world of possibilities and responsibilities. And no person is better qualified to explain the weighty issues involved than Dr. Doudna herself. So I now invite her to come forward and deliver the 2019 Beyond Annual Lecture. Thank you. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so very much for the introduction and for inviting me to ASU. I, uh, this is the kind of lecture that I really enjoy giving because I think it gives us a chance to think together about science that's happening right now that is impacting our world and will change the world that we live in. So tonight what I want to do is um, I'm going to tell you first about a remarkable technology doing something called genome editing that came about through a curiosity-driven set of experiments that led in an unexpected direction. Sort of the reason many of us go into science in the first place is that we're fascinated by the world we live in and we want to understand how things work. And that's, that's always been my reason for doing the kind of science that I do. And I'll tell you a story that uh, began with uh, one set of questions and led in a very different direction. And then I want to turn to the topic of the future. What does the fact that we now have a technology for editing the code of life mean for us as humans and for where we're going in the natural world and what we might do together and to change the world and hopefully make it a better place? So let me start uh, with how this technology began. And um, this is a a slide that shows the a cell that is being infected by viruses. So this is actually a bacterial cell. The sound level is a bit up and down. Up Would and you down. think it's more, more reliable? We don't want the two together. How's that better? Ooh, it sounds loud. OK. Should I start over? <laughs> I won't start over. Um, so I want, to, uh, I want to start by describing experiments that got started with really just a few scientists around the world who wanted to understand how it is that bacteria fight viral infection, such as this uh, example here, where viruses are landing on the surface of a bacterial cell and beginning the process of infection. 
and led to a very un, uh, led in, in an unexpected direction to a technology for editing the DNA, the code of life. And this uh, this work for me started, you know, if we rewind the clock about 12 years, with a phone call that I got in around 2006 or so from a colleague, Jill Banfield at Berkeley, who works in a very different area of science than me. So I've always studied the molecules of life and investigated what the structures of molecules can tell us about biological function. Jill Banfield has always been interested in the evolution of life. So she studies microbes that populate our environment and sequences their DNA to understand what kinds of organisms are living in our, in our natural world. And her research had uncovered something very unusual, like kind of a mystery, and that was that many bacteria, when their DNA was sequenced, revealed a pattern of DNA sequences in the genome. So this is a, you're seeing a circular, a diagram of a circular chromosome of a bacterium here that had an intriguing repetitive pattern it's shown uh, right here, hopefully I can point to this, there we go, um, where we have repeated elements of about 30 to 40 letters or base pairs in length in the DNA. So these are identical sequences that flanked short sequences of DNA that were unique. And this is an unusual enough pattern that it had been noticed by just a, a few labs that were starting to sequence bacterial DNA at that time. And they also noticed so that these had come to be called CRISPRs. And here's the, it's an acronym um, for clusters regularly interspace short palindromic repeats. I won't say that again. And, uh, and, they, and these tended to co-vary with CRISPR-associated or CAS genes. So these were places in the genome that encoded proteins. So this had the look of some kind of a conserved system in bacteria. And the question was, why? Like, why do a lot of bacteria have this pattern? And in around 2005, there were three articles published in, in journals that I certainly wasn't reading um, that were all from bioinformatics groups. These were people that do computational analysis of DNA sequences, and they noticed something very interesting. And that was that these se sequences of DNA that were unique in these CRISPR elements in bacteria were all derived from viruses. So they came from the viruses that infect uh, these bacteria. So it really had the look of a bacterial um, vaccination card, a way that, that bacteria could store pieces of DNA from their invaders in their own genome. And the question was, well, why would they do that? And so the hypothesis that Jill Banfield had at the time was that maybe these were the signatures of an adaptive immune system, a way that bacteria could acquire immunity to the viruses that infect these cells. And she called me because she knew that I, I, uh, I'm a biochemist. I've always worked on molecules, and, and in particular, molecules that control the way that genetic information is used in cells. And so she wondered if we might like to work with her lab to investigate whether, in fact, this immune system was operating, and if so, how it worked. And so what happened over the next few years in research that was done in a handful of labs, and largely um, initially in work done at a yogurt company uh, by scientists who wanted to very, had a very practical goal, which was to protect their cultures, uh, yogurt, cheese, things like that, from um, being infected by viruses and being destroyed, is that uh, it was shown that bacteria that have these CRISPR elements and the associated genes can acquire pieces of DNA from viruses and then generate an, a copy of these sequences in the form of RNA. So RNA is a chemical cousin of DNA that provides a kind of a little transient copy of that piece of genetic information in the cell. And these molecules of RNA were then processed. They were chopped into shorter bits that each included a sequence uh, in the RNA that comes from the virus. And then importantly, they combine with proteins encoded by the CRISPR-associated, these Cas genes, to form RNA-guided complexes, where the RNA is effectively the zip code for the protein. It provides the address label that tells this protein where to go. And the way that works is that these little molecules with their RNA guides will search the cell looking for matching sequences of DNA, sequences that match this copy in the RNA element. 
When that match occurs, the protein is recruited to that piece of nucleic acid, and it gets cut up and destroyed. So you can see how this is a great pathway in bacteria. It, acquires, it allows cells to acquire immunity and then use that information. It programs the cell to recognize those invaders if, if they should show up again and destroy uh, their nucleic acid. And, uh, and so uh, Jill Banfield, you know, my, my colleague, so we began meeting regularly and talking about this, and uh, my lab started to investigate how these molecules actually function in the system. And meanwhile, Banfield's lab was continuing to do what they do well, which is to research the microbes that populate the environment. And this is a slide that uh, was taken uh, pretty recently where they were, so these are uh, graduate students in her lab, looks like they're having a pretty good time. And uh, they actually go out and uh, get a little dirty and they, you know, if they collect samples, this is collecting samples of groundwater and soil up in Northern California. And here you can see um, a, a trench here with some water in it and uh, little uh, two test tubes on either side. So these are samples that are being collected from different spots along this, uh, this uh, 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 rope that's laying alongside the, 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 uh, this little uh, water um, inlet. And, um, and then what's in, the, what's in the samples? Well, this is a diagram of one of these test tubes. And what is done is to filter the water through a filter that, that uh, separates the organisms living in those uh, environmental samples from everything else. And then they can be easily sequenced. The DNA can be the code of life in these cells can be read. And they're, um, they're all the contents of those genomes can be analyzed. And in the course of doing this type of research, Banfield's lab and others doing similar types of experiments have uncovered many different varieties of this CRISPR adaptive immune system, such that we now have a large collection of diverse examples of these pathways. Now, for somebody like me that's always worked on molecules and we study uh, you know, kind of the how questions in biology. How do things work? This is being like a kid in a candy store, right? Because there's so many fascinating variations on this theme of adaptive immunity. And so we've continued to investigate some of the uh, molecules that are part of this pathway. And this is actually a cartoon that illustrates some of the diversity that's observed. So we can separate these CRISPR systems into two different classes. And beyond that, we have uh, different types. These on the top here in class one require multiple genes. That's what each of these boxes represents that are required for the immune system to function versus the types shown down here called class two that each have a large gene with a single uh, protein that's encoded that is essential for the function of the immune system. There's this kind of interesting diversity. And um, back in 2011, you know, we were initially investigating these class one systems with their multiple proteins and trying to figure out how they worked. And then I went to a conference and I met a scientist named Emmanuel Charpentier, a microbiologist who was studying a different kind of system belonging to the class two type down here. And when we met at that conference and we started talking about our lab's uh, respective research projects, we realized that we could team up to figure out the answer to what seemed like just a, a very natural uh, question at the time in the field of CRISPR biology, which was, what is the function of a gene known as Cas9, one of these large encoded proteins that is essential for function of, uh, of a CRISPR immune system in certain types of bacteria? Now, we were drawn to this because it seemed amazing that you could have systems that, in some cases, required many proteins to do what in this system, it seemed like only one protein was needed to do. And I thought, well, that's got to be a pretty interesting protein, kind of like a Swiss Army knife that might have lots of different functionalities to it. And so I wanted to understand uh, how it might work. Now, that embarked our labs on a wonderful collaboration that allowed uh, some young scientists who were working with us to do some really fun experiments. And, um, and in particular, uh, we started investigating the way that this Cas9 protein is able to cut DNA at places in the DNA sequence that match this sequence in the guide RNA molecule. This is showing a diagram of this. So these, this uh, protein turns out to be a chemical cleaver that can literally make a double-stranded break 
in DNA at a site that is marked by the sequence in the DNA matching this sequence of letters in the RNA uh, guide. And so when that double-stranded break occurs in bacteria, this leads to destruction of the DNA. And so, of course, if this uh, RNA guide is recognizing a piece of viral DNA, then the cell can cut it up and destroy it. But uh, when Martin Jinek, the postdoc in my lab that was doing this work initially, uh, started investigating how this works, he realized that, first of all, this is an, uh, a protein that's guided by two separate types of RNA that are shown here in the cartoon, CRISPR RNA and a type of RNA called tracer. He figured out that these could be linked together into a single uh, RNA molecule that we called the single guide RNA that would have the structural handle needed for interacting with Cas9. So that would be the same on every RNA molecule in the system. But it was then very easy to change the sequence here so that this uh, uh, address label could direct Cas9 to any desired segment of DNA. And for us, this was kind of the moment when this project went from being a curiosity-driven question, how does this immune system work, to realizing that this could be a powerful tool for manipulating the code of life in any cell because of its ability to easily trigger double-stranded breaks at any desired sequence by simply using uh, molecular biology methods to change the address label in this RNA molecule by altering the sequence right here. And just to show you why this is powerful, it turned out that at the time that we were doing this work, there was lots of work that had been going on over the last previous you know, two decades, really, showing that in our cells, in human cells, and animal and plant cells of all types, the cells um, respond to double-stranded DNA breaks in their genomes differently than in bacteria, where bacteria will lead, uh, quickly degrade the DNA. In our cells, those double-stranded breaks are recognized and repaired. And so this is a diagram that shows a cut being made in DNA. And the cell can either repair it by introducing a small change in the DNA at the site of the break to um, create a very tiny disruption in the, in the genetic code at that position, or uh, the cell can repair the break by introducing a new piece of DNA if it has some sequence in the DNA that match the sequence uh, elements flanking the double-stranded break site. So if you think about this, it's a way to trigger alterations to the genome of a cell by introducing a double-stranded break at a position where you might like to make a subtle change in the code or make a much larger insertion of new genetic information. So that wasn't our idea, but once we had discovered a molecule that had this very um, simple way of introducing double-stranded breaks at any desired position, we realized that that molecule could plug right into these pathways very easily and create a powerful tool for altering genomes. And I'm going to show you a, a short video that just illustrates how we imagine this system working in eukaryotic cells. So this is, here we are zooming into a cell, and in our cells, animal and plant cells, of course, the DNA is packaged inside the nucleus, and it's wrapped up around uh, proteins in green here that are um, uh, form chromatin, so they really compact the DNA into a small volume. And amazingly, this bacterial protein, Cas9, with its guide RNA, is able to search through all of the DNA in the genome of a cell to find a position that matches the RNA guide. When that match occurs, the DNA is cut, and then this protein hands off the broken ends of the DNA to repair enzymes in the cell that come in, and this is the little bit of the you know, hand-wavy part of the video, right? We sort of imagine how this might work, but in that example, there's a, an actual insertion of new DNA sequence in the process of repairing the break. And so remarkably, we published this work in the summer of 2012, and we proposed Cas9 and its guide RNA as a technology for genome editing. And what happened next was truly remarkable, because laboratories around the world quickly began adopting this strategy for genome editing in all kinds of biological systems, everything from human cells and stem cells to uh, zebrafish to plants, rice, wheat, 
uh, to mice, etc. Basically, every kind of organism that scientists were studying in laboratories became a subject for this technology. And this is, in fact, a, you know, this is sort of over the last seven years. When I think back on you know what's happened over the last seven years, it's been truly exponential growth of the adoption of this technology. And this is actually a slide I got from. Uh, from a uh, publisher, the Elsevier uh, publisher, uh, scientific publisher site website, they had this slide that just shows how earlier technologies for engineered proteins that could generate double-stranded DNA breaks and trigger genome editing. These were technologies known as zinc finger nucleases and mega nucleases and talon proteins. These all had uh, you know, started to be adopted by the scientific community, but they hadn't really taken off. They were, you know, difficult enough to use that most scientists didn't have the, either the ability or the funding to, you know, start using these widely. And the difference with CRISPR is that this is a technology that is so easily adaptable and it's easy to use, it's not expensive, it's, you can train a starting student in the lab to come in and start using it to edit cells within a matter of a few weeks. And so it took off like a rocket, right? And so this is really showing exponential growth. And now, like I recently did a search in PubMed, which is a web server that allows you to search all of the um, you know, biological and biomedical scientific literature. And there are literally almost 13,000 publications now, just since 2012, that are using this technology across sort of all different kinds of biology. So it's been a remarkable, remarkable few years to watch this taking off and think about all the things that are now possible using a tool that allows precise alteration of genomes. In my own lab, you know, we've continued to investigate how this works. We would love to understand this. So I showed you the video, and that's kind of an artist's imagination of how this works. But we'd love to actually understand this better so that we can figure out, first of all, how an amazing little machine is able to find and cut DNA so precisely, but also how we can better understand both, both where it came from, how did it evolve, and also how we can employ it for things that we might like to do, given a tool that provides this kind of, of uh, power. So I, I was going to mention just a couple of things about understanding this molecular mechanism. So we've been fascinated by this question of, DNA recognition, how does this enzyme Cas9 gain access to the DNA in a cell, and how does it find the right place to cut, and what happens when it finds the wrong place? How often does it do that? And um, how does it tell the cell, or how does the cell figure out how to repair the DNA? A lot of these questions really haven't been fully addressed yet, but I wanted to give you a little sense of how we study these sorts of things. This is actually a 3D model of the Cas9 protein with its guide RNA. Here's the orange uh, RNA molecule. And this is a, a model that was printed on a 3D printer using coordinates that are based on an actual molecular structure of Cas9. So we can purify these molecules in the laboratory. And this was actually work done by my former, uh, now postdoc, Martin Jinek, who did those original work on uh, experiments on Cas9 in our lab and was able to crystallize Cas9 bound to its RNA substrate. And so what you can see here is that when the protein holds on to DNA, so here's the beautiful DNA double helix uh, passing through the protein, at the position that matches the 20 letters in the guide RNA, this protein pries apart those two strands of the DNA and forms a helix of RNA and DNA inside the protein. And that's the actual recognition mechanism. That's how it finds the right place to make a cut. And then once that interaction happens, there are two chemical cleavers in the protein that can swing into position and actually cut these two uh, strands of the DNA. And I wanted to show you, here's a, a, a little uh, animation showing a, uh, an enzyme that uh, is also, you know, an RNA-guided protein, part of a CRISPR pathway. It's holding on to double-stranded DNA. And here you can actually see the different parts of this protein. It almost looks like a clamshell or a baseball glove or something. It's holding on to the RNA guide here inside the enzyme. 
and prying apart the two strands of the DNA so that the enzyme can get at them and actually make a cut. So one of the questions that we'd like to understand better is what are the energetics of that process? And if you think about it, you know, if we have DNA that's base paired, so we've got two strands of the DNA double helix and the chemical letters in the code are, of course, paired, A's with T's and G's with C's. And then, as I showed you in that video, the DNA in eukaryotic cells is packaged as chromatin. It's highly compacted. How does this enzyme actually get at uh, the, the, the DNA and pry the, apart the strands? And we don't fully know the answer to that question yet. And one of the curiosities is that, um, like in this cartoon, the enzyme doesn't have, it doesn't, it, it sort of is able to somehow massage apart those strands. It doesn't have an external energy source. It doesn't, uh, for those of you that are you know, students of, of biology, you know that you know, a lot of times energetic re re reactions that require energy in biology use ATP or GTP hydrolysis to drive those reactions, but not Cas9. So where does the energy come from to melt apart the two strands of the DNA? Now we suspect that one of the drivers of this is actually the conformational shape of the enzyme and the way that it changes shape when it interacts with RNA and with DNA. And I'll show you a, a, a little uh, animation that illustrates this. This was a uh, animation made by another student in the lab, Ben LaFrance, based on some work by a uh, uh, student, Sam Sternberg, um, cited here, who was able to trap the enzyme in different states of, of its structure as it assembles with RNA and DNA. So this is a, an animation that starts off with the structure of Cas9 by itself rotating into position um, into the shape that it forms when it binds to this guiding RNA. So you saw a big structural change in the gray part of the enzyme that creates a, a channel down the center of the protein. And when DNA binds, there's an additional change in the structure to accommodate that RNA-DNA hybrid. So this is the actual mechanism of recognition. And we think that's part of the uh, action of the enzyme that pries apart the DNA strands. And then finally, this uh, part of the enzyme here, the yellow uh, uh, part of the protein, swings into position as a cleaver and is able to cut the targeted DNA. So it's literally a little machine that's designed to grab onto DNA, pull apart the strands, and cut it at a place that matches the letters in the guide RNA. And it's amazingly accurate. It's not perfect, but it's very good at cutting DNA just at the desired place, probably because over evolutionary time, bacteria have selected for a protein that would be able to do this quite accurately to protect from viral infection without somehow damaging the genome of the bacterium itself. So I want to now turn to what's happening with CRISPR as a technology. And I want to tell you a little bit about three different areas where there's exciting advances happening. And I'm going to focus on some things that you might not have heard about with CRISPR biology, but where I think there's going to be exciting impacts in the not too distant future in public health, in agriculture, and in biomedicine. So in public health, there are two areas that, um, that I wanted to draw your attention to that I think are very interesting. One of them is that um, it's been possible to use the CRISPR-Cas9 system for gene editing in farm animals and animals that are important biomedically, such as pigs, for um, the purpose of altering their genetics in ways that could be beneficial. And this is an example of work being done to alter the genomes of piglets to make them potentially better organ donors for humans. And this has been done in two ways. One is using gene editing to remove integrated viruses that are part of these pig genomes that could other, if they were, if the organs were donated to a person, they could infect people. So we'd like to get rid of those first. And the other thing is to make the organs of these animals more human-like so that they are potentially going to be um, received better by a, um, a patient that might be receiving one of these organs as, uh, from a donor pig. And so this is work that's been going on in both companies and academic labs. And um, 
and, and this has led to thinking about how you could use uh, gene editing more broadly to impact public health. And, um, and this is an area that uh, has taken hold among people that think about the spread of genetic disease, especially by vectors like mosquitoes. And this is a slide that I wanted to show. Uh, it's actually taken from Science News because it's uh, illustrating something called a gene drive which is a way to introduce a genetic change into an entire population of organisms using a tool for genome editing. And, and this had been theorized about for a long time, probably ever since, you know, certainly maybe before I was a grad student, but I remember in graduate school people talking about this. But it never became really feasible to do it until there was an efficient way to alter genomes. And once CRISPR came along, it, it really became possible then to do this. And the way these work, this is showing on the left-hand side the normal pattern of inheritance. So we have a breeding pair of mosquitoes, and they've got uh, two different genotypes. And so you can see that this trait is passed along in a kind of a traditional sort of Mendelian way. But over here, if we have a gene drive in the genome of this uh, organism, then when this trait is passed on to progeny. The trait is passed along together with the molecule, in this case Cas9, that's able to insert the trait into other animals. And so you start to see that over time, the trait can spread and eventually uh, become a trait that's shared by virtually all of the animals in the population. So why, why do we care? Well, this is a, something that people are very excited about because it could provide a way to control mosquito populations and, and in particular, control their ability to spread parasites and disease. And so there's been lots of interest in this, but of course it also raises some very important questions about the safety and, and frankly the ethics of using a technology like this in this fashion in animals or organisms that might be released environmentally and could have unintended uh, consequences. And I'm gonna, that's a theme I'm going to keep coming back to, by the way, is you know, thinking about the awesomeness of what we can do with gene editing, but also the responsibility that comes with it, because it is, in fact, a very um, you know, a powerful tool. I want to turn to agriculture. So this is an example of some work that has been done by a remarkable scientist at Cold Spring Harbor Labs, uh, Zach Lipman, who's been working on tomatoes and other things. But, uh, but this is a, a really interesting uh, work that he published about uh, two years ago now, where he showed that you could use the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editor to alter tomatoes so that they would bear much heavier uh, um, uh, crops than from the starting variety. How did he do this? Well, is able to figure out how to dial up the expression of a gene that controls the number of flowers that are made by these plants. And, um, and so without altering anything else about these tomatoes, he just made plants that could bear uh, many more of them. And, uh, and I have a little uh, admission here, don't tell anyone, but I'm actually growing these right now at my house. And I'm really excited because, uh, you know, I'm going to see how many tomatoes I can get this summer. And, uh, and, and, and I'm going to really do the taste test and see, you know, I've got, toma I've got tomatoes growing that are pre-CRISPR and post, and I want to see do they really taste the same. So we'll see. I'll come back and tell you about that. Um, and, but this is raising uh, something else that I want to point out, and that is that it turns out that this gene that's affected here in tomatoes is uh, found in many plants. So it raises the possibility that we could dial up the yields of other types of plants as well and do it without altering their other traits, and also do it quite quickly compared to traditional plant breeding. Now another, uh, um, uh, this was work that was also published now maybe three years ago, a group at Penn State, so another academic lab, was able to show that they could alter, they could um, basically knock out a single gene in mushrooms that prevents mushrooms from turning brown when they get cut open. Who knew? Um, so it's kind of an in interesting thing. And, this attracted some attention because it raised the question of how do we think about a gene editing tool like this with respect to regulation? Are these uh, plant and agricultural products going to be considered genetically modified organisms, GMOs, or not? Well, um, right now, the US Department of Agriculture has weighed in on the mushrooms. So this is an article about these mushrooms. And uh, they decided that. In cases like this, where there's no foreign DNA introduced into the mushroom, it's simply a genetic knockout, 
but these would not be uh, regulated here in the United States. So these are not going to be uh, regulated versus what happens in other countries. So in, um, in Europe, for example, any uh, agricultural product that is the subject of manipulation by a technology such as CRISPR-Cas9 right now is proposed to be considered a genetically modified organism. So we have this funny situation where, depending on the country you live in, uh, something could be GMO or not. And it's raising a, a, a lot of uh, questions and people are trying to grapple with, you know, how do we handle a new technology like this? Is this something we want to encourage scientists to be using or not? And uh, how are companies that might want to develop products with this technology going to be uh, marketing their products in different parts of the world? So those questions are very much ongoing. And then finally, I want to turn to um, biomedical applications. And I wanted to share one experiment with you. This is actually from our own uh, research. So one thing that the gene editing technology of CRISPR does is it, it takes something that used to be really hard to do, and it makes it easy enough that even labs like mine that never in the past worked on, we certainly uh, barely worked on human cells that you could grow in a lab dish, much less uh, whole organisms, we started thinking about opportunities to investigate uh, the, how you could use a gene editing technology in the brain. And this is research done by a postdoc in my lab, Brett Stahl, who has been investigating how you might deliver the gene editor, CRISPR-Cas9, into the brain and get meaningful levels of genome editing that might one day allow us to do things like cure uh, neurodegenerative diseases that result from genetic mutation. And this is an experiment where he chemically modified the Cas9 protein to give it cell penetrating properties. And then this can be injected together with its guide RNA into the brain. This is doing an experiment in a mouse brain where we inject this uh, editor into the brain and then we can actually follow cells that get edited because this mouse has a label in the genome that gets turned on. It makes a red protein only when gene editing occurs at a precise position. And so what you can see here is that when we inject on two sides of the brain, we actually get uh, a, a decent volume of tissue that's edited on both sides. And when we look in detail at what cells are being altered, we find that these are neurons and uh, we're getting editing at exactly the position that this Cas9 protein is programmed recognize. And right now, we're actually using this in a mouse model of Huntington's disease, which is a neurodegenerative disease caused by a single uh, gene that's been mutated. And we're trying to figure out if we can actually use this strategy one day to create a uh, treatment or maybe even a cure for diseases uh, like that. That's a long time down the road, but that's, in my opinion, the kind of thing that academic labs should be investigating. This is not going to be prime time for a company anytime soon, but it's a great uh, thing to be studying in the research lab and try to figure out how we might do this kind of thing safely and effectively one day. And then I also wanted to uh, point out that in addition to using gene editing molecules to do things like this, it turns out that in research that was done by a couple of graduate students in my lab, uh, Alex East Seletsky uh, cited here, and, um, and Janice Chen and their colleagues cited here, these students figured out that there are some additional biochemical functions of CRISPR-Cas9 proteins, some of them, that actually allow use of these proteins to detect nucleic acids, to detect DNA and RNA molecules precisely. And, um, and they can uh, detect these, these molecules by uh, turning on an activity in the protein that releases a fluorescent signal that we can read out very easily in the lab. And it doesn't require any amplification using the polymerase chain reaction. We don't need fancy equipment. And we can get very sensitive detection of particular sequences. So you know, why would you want to do that? Well, it turns out that this can be very effective at detecting the presence of infectious bacteria, viruses. Uh, we can also detect the presence of sequences that are antibiotic resistant in these organisms. And in the future, we're hoping we can actually use this to detect things called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, that might be associated with either genetic disease or even cancer. 
And, um, and this has led to a whole um, sort of growing field of, of use of, of the CRISPR-Cas enzymes for diagnostics and the idea that one day we may have simple tools like this that we can use in a point-of-care setting in a clinic, maybe a very um, low-tech uh, kind of clinic out in the field where we can easily tell people that they have an infection that needs to be treated or that they have uh, some genetic predisposition that they need to pay attention to. And finally, um, I wanted to turn to the question of how genome editing, so turning back to the use of CRISPR-Cas tools for genome editing, how this editing is actually performed. Because it turns out that this leads to another profound question about how gene editing will be applied in humans in the future. And to, to explain this, I need to point out that you know, fundamentally, there are two different kinds of cell types that we can edit. There's somatic cell editing, which is what uh, most of the biomedical applications happening right now are, are trying to do, which means making de uh, genetic changes in cells that are not heritable. So they are not passed on to future generations, and they affect just one individual. But we can also imagine, and we can do, uh, germline editing that leads to heritable changes in DNA. And these changes affect not only an individual, but also all of their offspring. Now, this uh, kind of genome editing started to be done very, very early in, the, um, in sort of the applications of CRISPR-Cas9 technology with the use of germline editing in mice. This is actually an ex this is showing a, a mouse, a fertilized mouse egg. It's being held by a pipette tip over here on the left. And you can see a needle coming in on the right and injecting the CRISPR-Cas9 molecules into the, into the cell where genetic changes that are made then become part of this entire uh, organism. And when this mouse is born, those, tra those uh, changes are part of all the cells and can be passed on to future generations. So of course, you know, when this was done easily in mice and then in rats and then in zebrafish and other kinds of organisms, people started thinking, gee, I wonder if that could be done in mammals and could it be done in humans? And, and so back in 2015, you know, I had I'd been sort of thinking about this, and uh, there was work that was published in, uh, in earlier uh, in 2014 by a lab that showed you could do this kind of germline editing in monkeys, and it worked very, very efficiently. And so um, the question was, you know, how long will it be until someone does this in human embryos? And that question really bothered me a lot. And so I, I actually organized a meeting in early 2015 with about 20 scientists who met out in California to talk about this question. And what do we do as scientists? How do we grapple with this technology that puts an incredible capability uh, really within pretty easy access of people that know what they're doing and know how to work with, with embryos? And so that led to the publication um, in the spring, I think it was early 2017, of a report by the National Academies of Science that and uh, really look deeply at this question of human genome editing, and in particular, human germline editing, and made a set of recommendations that included um, the uh, recommendation that this kind of editing not be used clinically, meaning to create a gen genetically edited person, um, until and unless the technology could be thoroughly vetted, as well as uh, to provide time for societal discussions about the ethics of using this technology in that fashion. Now, um, uh, if you were um, you know, reading the news last, uh, last November, you might be aware that um, there was a, a, an announcement in November about someone in China who actually decided to go forward with clinical use of human germline editing. This is a picture that I took of this scientist. It's, his name is He Jiangkui, and uh, uh, he came to a meeting that I was part of, a, I was a, on the co-organizing committee of in Hong Kong, and announced that, in fact, uh, he and his team had made genetic edits to two baby girls that were born uh, with changes to their genome that were designed or intended to alter a single gene that is involved in susceptibility to HIV infection. Now, um, this, this was a really kind of a watershed moment. It was a, 
uh, for me, really kind of a, a crazy experience of seeing this thing that had been imagined for a while, and you know, we sort of hoped that these uh, guidelines that were adopted and put in place by an international committee would be respected. But um, it was remarkable to see this announcement because as the data were unveiled for this, um, for this set of experiments, it was clear that, in fact, what this scientists had done was to conduct experiments on people in a way that I found really quite shocking. And I'm going to show you, I just want to show you one slide. This is my, maybe my wonkiest uh, slide, but I'll try not to get too technical here. But I just really want you to notice, um, you know, all you have to notice here is that uh, the lines don't look the same. So the top is a cartoon of this gene, which is known as CCR5, and, um, and this indicates the position adjacent to the site that was edited. So he wanted to make a change, wanted to introduce a change into these baby girls that would, would replicate a natural occurrence that's very rare in human populations, but creates a deletion of 32 base pairs in the, in the uh, DNA of this gene that protects people from HIV infection. It's one of the ways that this gene, which encodes what's known as the HIV co-receptor protein, the way it was actually identified. But when he used the gene editing technology in, uh, in embryos, and this was done in, in an in vitro fertilization clinic, the changes that were actually made, which are shown down here, don't look like this, right? So these changes that were actually introduced and then identified by DNA sequencing are changes that have, to our knowledge, never been observed in human populations. And Furthermore, they've never been tested in animals. So this is truly experimentation on people. And, um, and so I think this, this really, you know, for many, many of us, certainly for me, it really uh, highlighted the need to accelerate the discussions around this and to really think hard about how we put in place regulations, requirements, whatever you want to call it, that will, uh, we hope, avoid future use of technology like this that, um, you know, where uh, the outcomes here are, are unknown. We don't know what will happen. We hope these baby girls will have healthy lives, and, uh, but, but it really is unclear right now what the consequences will be of the, the genetic changes that were introduced into their DNA. Now, there's also a lot of hype around uh, CRISPR babies, and this was actually a picture. This was on the cover of The Economist magazine um, at least three years ago now under the banner Editing Humanity. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of speculation about, you know, could we, uh, you know, could we uh, have uh, perfect vision? Could we have high IQs? Could we cure baldness? Something that some of my friends think would be pretty cool. Um, and, uh, you know, the answer is that in most cases, the answer is no because we don't know enough about the human genome to do these things even if we wanted to. And in many cases, these are traits that require probably tens or maybe hundreds or even thousands of genes that interact subtly with each other. And so they're not going to be uh, easily altered by a gene editing tool that is maybe at most able to alter a handful of genes in a cell at a time right now. Nonetheless, I think we really have to be thinking hard about what's going to happen down the road. And for the students here, you know, in the, in the audience, this is something that will undoubtedly affect you in your lifetime, is thinking about how people will use gene editing in the future. And in particular, will there come a time when people are using germline editing in embryos to make alterations to the genome that they think are going to be uh, beneficial in some way to their kids. It's a question, but I think it's a question that's not that far beyond where we are today with this technology. And so I think one very um, positive outcome of the, the uh, announcement in Hong Kong in November is that the World Health Organization has recently announced uh, the uh, convening of an international forum to look into the uh, editing of human genes, and in particular, they are um, starting to make very vocal sort of recommendations that would establish, in, in, I don't know if you saw this announcement recently, but they want to actually have a registry for people that are trying to use germline editing clinically so that it would be public knowledge who was doing this. I think that's one thing that 
uh, came, we came away from the Hong Kong meeting understanding is that we don't want to see this kind of thing going on in secret. It should be public knowledge. And, um, and then furthermore, I think there's a push in the National Academies of Science, who I've been working with, will be announcing soon a, sort of a, a similar kind of parallel international forum that will be working with the WHO group. And the idea there is to establish some very clear requirements for any future use of clinical uh, germline editing in humans. And that could establish a, a, a platform for regulation if, companies, uh, if countries would like to, to do that. Um, but at the very least, it would be, again, a very public set of criteria and requirements that would need to be met for any future uh, groups or teams that want to do this. So I want to uh, just wrap up here by pointing out that you know, this um, uh, RNA-guided ability to recognize a position in a genome, if you think about it, is a really remarkable tool. Because I did, And I didn't go into all the details tonight, but you know, because we can now direct these proteins to places in the genome, we can actually not only induce gene editing, but we can also change the levels of proteins that are made in, in cells, like that example with the tomatoes. And we can also do things like image the genome. We can light up particular genes and look at where they are in the cell and how they're, how they're interacting. So it's a very powerful platform that's driving a lot of science right now. A lot of the publications that are coming out are just you know, making new versions of this and using it in all sorts of creative ways. Um, we know that figuring out how to deliver gene editing molecules into organisms and tissues is going to be critical for all kinds of applications, not least of which are biomedical. And also figuring out how to control uh, these, um, these gene edits, not only in a chemical sense, so how we induce the cell to make the kind of uh, edit that's desired, but also how we figure out societal controls and, and regulations that will um, ensure responsible use of the technology. And then, of course, um, uh, you know, ongoing fundamental research continues, and that will, I think, continue to drive not only this technology, but what comes next, whatever is after CRISPR, right? And I personally think that a good, a likely, a good bet of where that'll come from is from the kind of work that Jill Banfield and her colleagues are doing, where they're out mining these microbes in our environment to find out all of the interesting biological pathways that they have that haven't even been investigated yet by scientists. And I'll conclude there. I want to acknowledge a great team. So one of the things that I love about doing science is that I have the privilege of working with incredibly smart uh, people who come to the lab. These are uh, graduate students, postdocs, undergraduates who come to work on projects and uh, work together with uh, each other, but also with various collaborators. So we've worked with a number of colleagues at Berkeley who are shown here. Of course, Emmanuelle, uh, I'm always uh, very grateful to her for the work we did originally with her lab on CRISPR-Cas9. And then increasingly, we're working with colleagues like Joel Pilewski and his lab members at UC San Francisco to apply CRISPR tools in the clinic. And so with his team, we're actually developing these uh, CRISPR-Cas enzymes for diagnostics for, uh, to detect cancer-causing viruses in tissue samples that come from uh, people that are living in various parts of Africa where they don't have access to really high-tech uh, tools. And so having a, a technology like this could be very beneficial. And then finally, you know, when you're an academic scientist and you're doing uh, research, we're all dependent on people uh, and organizations that provide the funding for this uh, type of work. And um, we're grateful to the, all of these organizations, but I t particularly want to call out the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the National Science Foundation. So these two organizations uh, gave my lab critical funding in the very early days when we were curious about this possible bacterial immune system called CRISPR and, and uh, had no idea where it would go. So I'm in just really indebted forever to, to those organizations for trusting us and letting us do the curiosity-driven science that led uh, to the work that I showed you today. And I'll stop there, and I'd be happy to address questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for that fascinating and thought-provoking lecture. We're going to have to squabble over the microphone uh, for moderating the questions. Uh, before we get into questions, some of you may have noticed some weird music that was being played when you were waiting for the lecture to begin. 
And uh, this is the product of ACE, the Arizona Cancer Evolution Center. It's a musical representation of cancer. So this is music that gets cancer. Uh, Sean Rupp, uh, Athena Actipis, and Carlo Maley are responsible for this. They probably have the copyright. Uh, and uh, if it sounded pleasing, then I think they got it wrong. It's uh, meant to sound weird and, uh, and a bit sinister. Um, I should also mention that when we're, we're done with the Q&A, uh, Jennifer has kindly agreed to sign books, which I hope are out there somewhere, uh, and so and that will wrap up the evening. Uh, but I think uh, you've raised so many uh, important issues. Do we need the, the uh, projector on? Because it's, if we could just, just kill the projection, please, because it's blinding me as I stand here. Uh, and then, uh, then I'll be able to see uh, any hands. Uh, and uh, I'll try to be equally fair to sort of left and right, front and back, young and old. Uh, so uh, do we have any, any questions? So we'll start left. Uh, gentleman at the back there, yes? I will repeat the question, so just shout it out. So it's, the question is about extracting stem cells from a living individual and then processing them and making them available uh, at a later stage for tissue regeneration and such matters. Fascinating question. I am absolutely not qualified to answer that question. So I don't want to make a recommendation either way. I think you have to, you have to vote your conscience there. <laughs> you or me. <laughs> um, yeah, but it, I think you, but maybe I'll just make a comment, and that is that I think you're highlighting something very interesting, which is that, you know, the whole field of stem cell biology is advancing very quickly right now. And, um, and you know, there's lots of interest in the possibility that at some point it will be possible to regenerate organs and um, you know, maybe even regenerate uh, the brain you know, using, using stem cells. But I, I, my personal feeling is that we're still probably decades away from that. I could be wrong. But. Thank you. Now let's go to one on the right. Uh, and I'll take uh, from the front, and then we'll sort of pop around. Uh, lady here. Yeah, so it's what, what uh, in the, the, the Chinese twins, what was Dr. Chen trying to achieve? What was he up to? Yeah, so, and actually his name was He, Dr. He. And, uh, and I think what he was up to, what he claimed, was that he was trying to protect these girls from HIV infection because they were being, uh, they were born to parents where the father was HIV positive. Now the thing that doesn't make sense about that is that if you if you you know I didn't really know anything about this but it turns out that there's an established procedure for people that are in that situation who want to have children and ensure that the HIV virus is not passed to them and uh, it doesn't require genome editing right so I think that you know this was really a case where um, it was almost like, uh, just to me, it seemed like a justification for doing something that really was not medically warranted. And I think an important point, uh, Jennifer, is that it's not just these little girls who've been genetically modified, but all of their subsequent children, that all, all the way down the germline. Uh, and that's the point. You don't know what the downstream consequences might be. Uh, so I'm going to take uh, one from the middle there, yes?
Yes, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> yes. Get, tell us some scare stories. Yeah, so worst case scenario, uh, uh, George Orwell, um, brave, new, brave New World. I think some of the examples that I mentioned tonight are things that, if taken to an extreme, could be dangerous. For example, using a gene drive in a, in a population of organisms in the environment where we can't predict what the outcome will be. What if we wiped out a population of insects that are important to support the ecosystem, for example, right? So I think that's something. I think the, uh, you know, the example with the CRISPR babies is another. But really, the, to me, the overarching uh, aspect of all of that, those types of applications really highlights the, you know, what I sort of maybe worry about the most, which is that um, I worry about scientists forging ahead to use a technology in a way that will create a backlash against it that will prevent progress, you know, because I think that many of us working in this field feel that there are so many exciting and positive opportunities with this. We would hate to see some kind of backlash that prevents it from actually helping people. Yeah, prudence becoming paralysis, that's always a danger. Now, uh, there's a lady in a red dress there, so that's, you're easy to identify and explain. I'm um, not sure I understand that well enough to repeat it. Perhaps you could. Uh, I'll, I'll do my best uh, to, to try to repeat it. So, so the question is, what really, I think you're asking, what causes a gene drive? So when I showed you the cartoon of those mosquitoes where on one side it was normal kind of Mendelian inheritance, on the other side you saw this red trait taking over the population pretty quickly. Why is that? And the reason is that the way that, that those gene drives are set up is that the trait that's being inherited is co-inherited with the editor, right? So with CRISPR-Cas9. And because that Cas9 is designed and it has its own, it's bringing along its own guide to recognize the genome and make a cut, it allows very easy editing of any genome that it lands in. Okay, so it basically, you know, makes sure that that trait gets in, not, not only inherited, but it actually can spread very quickly horizontally in these organisms. Okay, I think we're going to have just a couple more questions, and there's lots of hands. Uh, so I, I'm going to uh, invite Amanda there, who <laughs> I know. I don't know why it's doing this to me only. Amanda, uh, go, go ahead. I'm too close, but then if I, all right, but go ahead. Uh, so it's uh, gene editing uh, uh, to replace antibiotics. Uh, I think that is such an exciting question because um, there's a growing interest in exactly that application of CRISPR. So if you think about how these pathways are used in nature, they're actually used to um, you know, fight viruses, but we know that they can be programmed also to target you know, essentially other, other genomes. And so imagine that you could program uh, these kinds of editors so that they would target particular kinds of bacteria that are harmful to people, and you could deliver them using, um, you know, phage or, you know, other kinds of mobile DNA that naturally get into these bacteria but don't affect humans. I think this could be very interesting. So there's a lot of um, work going on in this field. It's, I would say it's quite early stage right now. Um, and at Berkeley, we have a team of, of microbiologists that are working on this question. So it's not something that, you know, you're not going to be 
uh, popping pills next year uh, with this. But I think it's an important direction because, as you pointed out, one of the big medical challenges that we're facing is the fact that a lot of our antibiotics are becoming ineffective because of resistance in bacteria. So we do definitely need new strategies for dealing with that. Uh, Jennifer, can you turn a cat into a dog? <laughs> uh, I think we're only going to have two more questions. One from the extreme right there, uh, a young lady in a yellow top. Right, so it's whether Cas, whether Cas9 can get into the chromatin, uh, which is sometimes all scrunched up and sometimes opened out. The hetero and uh, what's the other one? You, you got. Yeah, great question. And the answer is it does. So it actually can deal with even highly compacted parts of the genome, such as heterochromatin. Um, how does it do that? We don't know. But, um, but we know that it does because uh, people have done experiments where they target genes that are in heterochromatic regions and they get edited. We did one experiment uh, uh, work that we published a couple of years ago where we visualized Cas9 molecules as they interact with DNA in both compacted parts of the genome and more open parts. And what we saw there was that Cas9 can actually get into these compacted parts, it just takes longer. Okay, we're going to have one final question, and I guess it'll be from the middle there. Uh, the gentleman with the glasses on the top of his head. Right. Right, your, your, your proteins did look awfully lifelike, and uh, in, the, in the animation, they certainly look like they know what they're doing. That's a, that's a deep question. And I think the answer is it all boils down to chemistry. Yeah. 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 So there's a, you're a physicist, so here's what I would say. There's a wonderful paper just got posted on BioArchive, which is our version of the preprint server in biology. It's like archive, but bio. And, um, and it's by a scientist, Kushu, who happens to be a colleague of mine at Berkeley, but I didn't know that. I just saw this paper, and I thought, wow, that's really cool. And I saw it was by his lab. And um, he was doing research on it, sort of exactly this question. And he's not, he wasn't actually doing it with Cas9. He was doing it with other kinds of molecules. But he was asking the question, how do molecules move around DNA, how do they move around a nucleus of a cell? And the answer he came up with, I think, is it really is chemistry. It's all about the charge properties of the protein in question that affect the kinetics of the protein and its ability to interact in a, what turns out to be a very viscous medium, which is the, the nucleus of the cell. So I would definitely direct you to that publication on BioArchive if you're interested, because when we saw this paper, we thought, ha, huh, I wonder if that actually helps us understand and explain these kinds of movements. And we're now going to do some experiments along the lines of what he's reporting in that manuscript to test the idea. OK, well, on that note, I'm going to uh, thank you.